Good morning again. We're going to turn to your notes. We're going to now address the line of the Millerites, the reform line. It is found in your notes in page 109. I just want to address here just briefly a, a point that perhaps was not clarified enough here in regarding to the line of Ezra. We were saying that before the reform line, before the time of the end, there's always a period of darkness that precedes. And this was the darkness that existed in Babylon, Babylon for during the 70 year period. The 70 year period I technically ended here when Cyrus is going to pass the first decree. Nevertheless, it was in existence. <clears throat> and they were living in Babylon. God's people were living in Babylon. But God had designated that he had given a prophecy specifically describing the mission of Cyrus. So this is what we are marking here. But the Cyrus was the, the instrument that was going to be used. God described his mission, what he was going to do, and what was the command that he had for him. The, he had to willfully, he had to condescend, or, or he, had, he had to accept the commission God had given him and is rebuilt the temple. So there was an increase of knowledge when he realized the Bible has been describing all that I have been doing. He had already conquered Babylon and it was describing his mission. When he realizes that and that God knows him by name, then he decides that he is going to do the work. He's going to be obedient, he's going to perform the work and I believe this is perhaps when the message is formalized when he he decides he's going to cooperate with the God he acknowledges to be the God of heaven. <clears throat> and, but then, that resolution even had to be in power. The Michael had to come because Satan was really uh, trying to... Satan was trying because Satan knew that this history was necessary to be put in place so that the, the starting point for the prophecy that pointed to the Messiah. He wanted to, to uh, interfere in this history. So this is just the comments that I wanted to address. So now let's go to the flight of Miller, William Miller and or the Millerites. And page 109 of your notes, we are perhaps a little bit more familiar with this. So all of us maybe familiar already with this information is going to be a review for us. The period of darkness, the 1260 years of papacy, which Sister White already we read the quote, she compared it with the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Parallel history. This 70 years ended in the year 1798, which we know is the end of several time prophecies. Can you give me one example, for instance? We have the 1260 years, the time, times, and a half, right? What other time prophecy ended in 1798? The 12520 for the northern tribes that ended in 1798. What other time period you can recall? The 1290. <coughs> from 508, 1798. And there's another time prophecy. There's another prophecy. And anyone remembers? Daniel 11. Daniel 11, part A, right? This is time the end. So we have some examples. That's a very important mark in, in prophetic history. Uh, the darkness was the mystery of iniquity and that was already at work. 
This is the quote that you have in your notes at the bottom from Great Controversy, page 49. And this is describing that from the days of the Apostle Paul, he was seeing already the compromise, or, or the he was seeing the beginning of what will become the papacy, that combination of truth and error that the Bible describes as the the mystery of iniquity. A falling away had to take place that the mystery of iniquity may be revealed in the or the son of perdition. And it says that the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians foretold the great apostasy which would result in the establishment of the papal power. He declared that the day of Christ should not come there should not come. There come a falling away first, and that the men of sin may be revealed, the son of perdition who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself to see he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3, 4, and 7. And furthermore, the apostle warns his brethren that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Uh, even at that early date, he saw creeping into the church errors that would prepare the way for the development of the papacy, little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly, as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of dead men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work, although almost imperceptibly, the customs of hedonism found their way into the Christian church. So that's the history of the first four churches, the first four seals. Uh, so time of the end, we already mentioned that several time periods came, came to an end in 1798. This is when the first angel arrives. So we make the mark here. First angel, A, meaning arrives. And 1798, <coughs> In Millerite history, denominational history, uh, we learned that in 1798 William Miller received his student concordance. And that is what he's going to use to, as a tool to study the Bible. Uh, he's going to study the Bible very methodic methodically using the rules that God gave him. And that is going to begin an increase of knowledge in from the years 16, 16, I'm sorry, 1816 through 1818. He was uh, studying the Bible very, uh, very deeply, and he came to the conclusion that the judgment was going to come, uh, was going to take place in their time. So, <clears throat> this brings us to the next waymark, which is the formalization of the message. And the events we mark there is in the year 1833, he's going to receive, William Miller is going to receive his credentials. Um, as a preacher, Baptist preacher, and this is going to allow many doors to open for him to preach the present truth for that generation. And at that time, also, there were external events that took place. You have the falling of the stars in that same year, and um, then. We come to this important event, which is in history. It was August, well, 11 of August, uh, year 1840. And the, the increase of knowledge. I, I need to emphasize this point before I proceed. 
the increase of knowledge was based on the prophecies of Daniel and uh, more specifically the, the prophecy that brought conviction to William Miller was uh, taken from Daniel 8.14 and that is uh, we're told in inspiration that was the foundation and main pillar of Millerite understanding so he was he was studying the scriptures and this is this is important here and this quotes here is the quote from Great Controversy page 320 it's near the at the bottom Great Controversy 320 page 110 it says with intense interest he studied the book of Daniel and the Revelation employing the same principles of interpretation as in the other scriptures and found to his great joy that the prophetic symbols could be understood he saw that the prophecies so far as they had been fulfilled had been fulfilled literally that all the various figures metaphor, metaphors parables similitudes etc were explained in their immediate connection or the terms in which they expressed were defined in other scriptures. What this is telling us is that he realized that the prophecy was given in figures, metaphors, parables, similitudes. It was given in a symbolic language. But that symbolic language could be understood. And once these various symbols were explained, they were actually pointing to historical events that were going to take place literally. And so he had this method of study that Sister White is describing for us here. And thus, I was satisfied, he says, that the Bible was a system of revealed truth so clearly and simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not bear the rain. Link after link of the, of the chain of truth rewarded his efforts as step by step he traced down the great lines of prophecy. Angels of heaven were guiding his mind and opening the scriptures to his understanding. I believe this quote is very relevant because it's explaining to us the way William Miller understood the prophecies. And she explains to us that they were literally fulfilled, but they were given in figurative language that the Bible he allowed through these rules of interpretation he allowed the Bible to explain these various figures and next quote bottom of the page 110 from early writings 229 God set his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible to let him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had been ever dark, that had ever dark, been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him. And he was led on to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. He saw that a perfect chain of truth, there a perfect chain of truth, that word which he had regarded as uninspired, now opened before his vision in its beauty and glory. He saw that one portion of scripture explains another, and that one passage was close to his understanding. When one passage was close to his understanding, he found it in another part of the word, that which explained it. He regarded the sacred word of God with joy and with the deepest respect and awe. As he followed down the prophecies, he saw that the inhabitants of the earth were living in the closing scenes of this world's history, yet they knew it not. He looked at the churches and saw that they were corrupt, that they had taken their affections from Jesus and placed them on the world. They were seeking for worldly honor instead of that honor which comes from above, grasping for worldly riches instead of, playing, of laying up the, their treasure in heaven. He could see hypocrisy, darkness, and death everywhere. His spirit was stirred within him. God called him to leave his farm as he called Elisha 
to leave his oxen at the field of his labor to follow Elijah. With trembling, William Miller began to unfold to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God, carrying his hearers down through the prophecies to the second advent of Christ. With every effort, he gained strength. As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaim the second advent of the Son of God. So, this is describing the work of John the Baptist in this time period, which was William Miller, and how a message was given of God to him, as he behold, in the one hand, the coldness and hypocrisy existed in, among God's professed people in, during that time. And as he also understood from the prophecies that the end was drawing near, he was raised up as a reformer to preach the message of repentance of sin and the, to put in place that system of truth. And the message was formalized, as we already mentioned, from great controversy. Here's the quote, page 30, 332. In 1833, Miller received a license to preach from the Baptist Church on which he was a member. A large number of the ministers of his denomination also approved his work, and it was with their formal sanction that he continued his labors. So that's the formalization. He is now formally preaching the message. He's going to be in power on August 11, 1840. This is a quote from Great Controversy, page 334. Three hundred and thirty-four. The it says in the year eighteen forty. This is at the bottom of page one hundred and eleven. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest, and it's going to describe here that Josiah Lich, which was one of the ministers that had joined William Miller in his message, has adopted the same uh, rules of interpretation and had come to the conclusion that the Ottoman Empire, which was a, a power that was causing the um, distress of nations. It was, it was an Islamic nation, the Ottomans, and this nation had been, uh, had been a powerful uh, empire for centuries, and now it was coming to uh, an end. And this was predicted in Revelation chapter 9. This is the history of the woes, which we have here, we are familiar with. <clears throat> and uh, we have, even in this 1850 chart, we're giving the dates for these woes. The first woe dealing uh, with 12, the years 1290. This is the period of 150 years that is connected with the first woe in Revelation 9, uh, I believe it's 9, uh, 15. Uh, so, oops. and then the second woe is the period that in Revelation is described as an hour and a day and a month and a year. All of this is uh, contained in Revelation chapter 9. This is the history of the first and second world. Nine. Yes, uh, the, the first period is found in verse 5 of chapter 9. Verse 5 and in verse 10. 
is repeated. 150 years, and this period is of 391 years and 15 days. Did both these periods, um, this period succeeded this, and they came to an end in the year 1840. The Second War came to an end. This is what she is describing here. It says, in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before Josiah Leach, one of the leading ministers, preached the second, preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition in Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculation, this power was to be overthrown in the year 1840, sometime in the month of August, and then only a few days previous to its accomplishment he wrote allowing the first period of 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled uh, and before the Akosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks this is what ended this time period and then uh, the 390 one years and 15 days commence at the close of the fir first period. It will end in August 11, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. So they were taking the risk of publish, announce in advance, the end of a power uh, that had ruled it was becoming weaker, but it had ruled the nations for centuries. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her, her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe, and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. Uh, when it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. This is the empowerment of the first angel. When the prophecy of Revelation 9, uh, that is 9 verse 15, it says, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year. In other words, for, they were loosed, four angels were loosed for 391 years and 15 days. So the, the, if they were loosed for that period of time, the inference is that at the end of that period they will be once again restrained. So what happened here is the Islam it was allowed to, during this period to be let loose, but then at the end of it, August 11, 1840, it is restrained as the four nations of Europe are going to uh, or the Ottomans are going to surrender their uh, autonomy or their Sovereignty, thank you, to the four European nations. And uh, this is marking the Islam is used by God, was used by God during this history to mark the empowerment of the first angel. So we see how the trumpets are intimately connected with our history. Because use, God uses a prophecy of Islam to bring power to the Millerite message. Because it's going to prove that the rules of prophetic interpretation and the principle that they were using is the Yulei principle. And in this prophecy, it's perhaps of the Bible the one that uh, more, um, it can be used in a, in a very... Uh, Precise way, because it's saying, it's marking an hour, a day, a month, a year. And when they made the calculation, it gave exactly 391 days and 50 years. And they calculated that period of time, and they were able to announce in advance 
this date, and when this date came to pass, the, the surrendering of the Ottoman Empire took place. And when that became known, that happened in, when the, the news arrived by boat, and it became known, uh, many, we're told, many men of learning and position united with Miller, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. This is when the message became sweet, because this is the angel that descends here, the divine symbol that descends here is found in Revelation 10. This is the angel of Revelation 10, and this is the angel that brings the little book. And in Revelation 10, it says, verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as a pillar of fire, and he had in his hand a little book. Open it. And um, he, was, he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And this is when the seven thunders are going to be heard, and then this is the little book that John is going to be commanded to take and eat it. So this is marking a test that is going to take place in this generation. This message that has been put in place and that has been empowered, now God is going to use to test the professed people of God that during this time it was the Protestants. This was the Protestant churches. Miller himself was the Baptist preacher. And the, the Protestant churches were going to be tested whether if they truly love Christ and His truth. Or they rather love the battle, the, the wine of Babylon they had been drinking for so long. And this was the worldwide message. And then... Uh, the foundations, we're going to jump to foundations in the page 112 of your notes. The foundations are laid May 1842. The foundation, well, it's from Daniel, Daniel 8. 14, but foundations visually, this was this chart. It was the chart, the 1843 chart. And this is where the message, the various lines of the message were uh, expressed in a visual form that could be read. And the quote you have there from early writings 258 God had been God had led them long step by step until he had placed them upon a solid immovable platform I saw individuals approach the platform and examine the foundation uh, Joseph Bates has a quote here from the second Advent Waymarks and High Heaps, page 52. In May of 1842, a general conference was again convened in Boston, Massachusetts. At the opening of this meeting, Brother Charles Fitch and Apollos Hale of Haverville presented as the visions of Daniel and John, which they had painted on cloth with the prophetic numbers and ending of the vision, which they call a chart. That's the 1843 chart that came into history in May of 1842. Why was it called 1843? Because initially, they believed the periods will terminate in that year. 1843, 1843, 1843, this timeline that began in 1677 with the 2520 reached what they thought was the at the end in 1843 when God's everlasting kingdom was going to be established. Um, so that's why it was called 1843 chart. And um, we're told the 
as early in, as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run the read it, it had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and the Revelation. She's quoting here about chapter 2. The publication of this chart was regarded as the fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. No one, however, then noticed that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision for a tearing time is presented in the same prophecy. After the disappointment, this scripture appeared very significant. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though we tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It would not tarry. The just shall live by his faith. And Sister White endorsed this chart, as we know. The Lord showed me that the 1843 chart was directed by his hand, and that no part of it should be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand had, was over in, in any state, singular, in some of the figures, so that none could see it until his hand was removed. And his mistake, as we know, was that the periods did not really end in 43, but they extended until 1844. Yes. So, uh, the test began, we already mentioned that. And the activities of the enemies we are marking here, the enemies are going to be at work in that history in June of 1842, within a month of the publishment of this chart, you have already a reaction. When the churches are going to begin to close their doors, it says, from Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21. In June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures in Portland. And jumping, it says, with few exceptions, the different denominations closed their doors of their churches against Mr. Miller. Many discourses from the various pulpits sought to expose the alleged fanatical errors of the lecturer, but crowds of anxious listeners attended his meetings, while many were unable to enter the house. And she says that she had the privilege to attend in person to these meetings. So we are marking here as uh, the work of the enemies. Uh, June of 1842, the resistance that begins to take place as the doors begin to close for the message. And the next significant event we are marking in this line is the arrival of the second angel and arrives at the time of the first disappointment, which we are going to mark it. The precise date we are going to mark here is the 19th of April and of the year 1844 and we will have an opportunity for those of you that may wonder why exactly 19 of April we will have an opportunity to deal with this more specifically in a later presentation but this is the date when the first disappointment is going to take place this is marking the first disappointment uh, of the Millerites and we have this quote prove it. it says from early writings 247 another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to earth Jesus placing his hand in writing and as he came to the earth he cried Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What angel is she quoting here? Second angel. Revelation 14.8. 14.8, that's correct. Then I saw the disappointed ones again raise their eyes to heaven, looking with faith and hope for the Lord's appearing, but many seem to remain in a stupid state as if asleep. So that's marking... What we will see in a moment, this is the parallel of ten virgins that is 
fulfilling more fully here, and he's saying that they fell asleep. Yet I could see the trace of deep sorrow upon their countenances. The disappointed ones saw from the scriptures that they were in the tarrying time. So this is simultaneously also the tarrying time. And this is another preference to the peril of ten virgins. Well, in bright and tarry, you're told in Matthew 25, 5, they all slumber and slept. So, she's saying, the disappointed ones saw from the scriptures that they were in the tearing time and that they must patiently wait the fulfillment of the vision, the same evidence which led them to move for their Lord in 1843, led them to expect Him in 1844. Yet I saw that the majority did not possess that energy which marked their faith in 1843. Their disappointment had dampened their faith. So they were discouraged. That was the result of the first disappointment. They realized that they were to tarry because the bride was tarry as well. And they had to wait for further light from the Lord to clarify the misunderstanding, the mistake. The light that brings that clarification is what we know as the midnight cry, the true midnight cry that is going to arrive here. This is going to be the, the manifestation of the power of God that is taking place during this time. And the language is taken from the same parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. Uh, and it's... <coughs> we're told in early writings, page 238, near the close of the second angel's message. So this is near the close. This is we mark here the arrival of the second angel, the arrival, this is where the message is going to be empowered, second angel empowered, it is saying that near the close of the second angel after it had arrived, uh, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God, the rays of this light seemed bright as the sun. And I heard the voice of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them from the, for the great work before them. In every part of the land, light was given upon the second angel's message, and the cry melted the hearts of thousands. It went from city to city and from village to village until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. In many churches the message was not permitted to be given and a large company who had the living testimony left though these fallen churches. So there's the living testimony is being manifested during the midnight cry. That means that they are giving a true Christian testimony or witness. And they have been revived, the faithful, the wise. And, um, <clears throat> and they left the fallen churches during that time. Uh, 50,000 were told withdrew from the churches when, they, when this, might, this mighty call was given. And she continues in the quote, A mighty work was accomplished by the midnight cry. The message was heart-searching, leading the believers to seek a living experience for themselves. They knew that they could not lean upon one another. So this was an individual, an individual matter, yeah, an individual connection with the Lord. And from Great Controversy, page 402, the message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, was not so much a matter of argument, though the scripture proof was clear and conclusive. There went with it an impelling power that moved the soul. 
There was no doubt, no questioning. Upon the occasion of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, she is now draw, drawing this direct connection to the triumphal entry that we mentioned yesterday. The, upon the occasion of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the people who were assembled from all parts of the land to keep the feast, flock to the Mount of Olives. She's referring to the, to the feast of Passover. Flock to the Mount of Olives as they joined the throng that were escorting Jesus. They caught the inspiration of the hour and helped to swell the shout. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 21, 9. In like manner, the unbelievers flock, who flock to the Adventist meetings, some from curiosity, some merely to ridicule, fail, feel the convincing power of the message, Behold the bridegroom coming. So this is quoting Matthew 25, 6. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold the bridegroom coming. After that wonderful experience that Sister White describes, she went through this whole process herself. And she describes this as the, the best memories she had Amen. for her whole lifetime. This was the most special. That, that was the power of the midnight cry. Those that went through it never forgot it. Never forgot that the deep solemnity that they experienced as they were searching their hearts, wanting to make sure that there was nothing between them and the Lord which they expected to see coming right here. The midnight cry was a clarification of the light that they had already been given from the beginning. Because it was simply that they came to the correct termination of this prophetic period and this prophetic period and they came they came it was just a sharpening remember that the hand of the lord had been over a mistake the purpose of god was to test them because what happened here when the first disappointment arrived is that from about 20 20 I mean, 200 thousand followers of the message when the first disappointment arrived they went down to well during this period they became 50,000 so it drastically dropped and I don't know the exact numbers but I know that by the summer there were about 50,000 that came from the churches and joined the movement so it dropped significantly here and this is when the separation took place from the protestant churches because we read the second angel arrived a second angel came down and we read that it had a writing in their in his hand and it had a message and this uh, caused a separation from the protestant churches the protestant churches did not want to come up and uh, of the Babylonian darkness. They wanted to remain there, and therefore only the faithful, which were the Millerite Adventists, is what was born. This movement is where it became a peculiar and distinct movement right here, after the first disappointment, during the tearing time. And it is at the midnight cry when they're going to receive the clarification of what went wrong with this calculation. And once they saw the, the error was corrected, they knew they, they knew not only that it will end in 1844, but actually they, they understood the, the exact date in advance. And that is October, or 22nd of October, uh, 1844. This is what we understand now, is when the third angel arrived. But with the arrival of the third angel, also a disappointment arrived. And we have this quote from early writings, page 
882. It says, um, O oh, heaven, watch with the deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. But many who profess to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The midnight cry is what prepared us to enter here, okay, in the most holy place. In our time period, the midnight cry is what prepare us, what will prepare us for the Sunday law. Uh, and this <clears throat> And by rejecting the two former messages, they gave, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way into the most holy place. I saw that as the Jews crucified Jesus, so the nominal churches have crucified these messages. And therefore, they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. So she's telling us that without a correct understanding of these three messages and this everlasting gospel process, we cannot enter Christ and with Christ by faith into the most holy place and be benefited by His intercession. A disappointment took place, you know that. And this disappointment had been configured by all the previous disappointments that we have had mentioned. This was Ezra disappointment. Uh, the disappointment of the disciples, the disappointment of the Hebrews at the Red Sea when they saw Pharaoh coming after them and the Red Sea in front of them and um, five minutes yes five minutes thank you then this brings us to the number seven this is a way mark that we I have not really commented on but it is also present in all these lines the number seven is seen here at the third way mark and uh, in this history, we, we could mark a few of them. One of them is the, what took place on October 22nd, 1844. Seven, sound of the seventh trumpet. The sound of the seventh trumpet mm -hmm. took place right there. And uh, also during the third angel's message, they're going to be pointed to the seventh day Sabbath in the year 1846. In this history, the number seven, in connected with the third way mark uh, is the uh, has to do with the seven weeks by uh, yes the when you connect the, remember that the, the period of 2,300 2,300 years is broken in sections you have the you have the 70 uh, Yes, Yes, you have, you broke that period, it's the 70 weeks, and then uh, 62 weeks, yeah. Seven weeks and 62. Seven weeks and 62. So it takes place from here. Yes, I was, for some reason, I was thinking of the ending point. Yes, this is the beginning. It's broken in seven weeks, and then 62 weeks, and that takes you to the last week here. That was, my mind was a little bit backwards at this point. Yes, this is the, when the 70 weeks begin, so it's broken in seven, 62, and one week, which is this, uh, this is half of this last week. The other half is ends when the stunning of Stephen takes place. So this is the seven weeks that is, uh, Mark here or number seven. This uh, 
Christ is going to be resting on the tomb on the seven day Sabbath. It's marking for us the seventh. And here, um, Passover. I don't remember right now exactly. But there is, <clears throat> there is another. Uh, so I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, one thing I do remember, I don't remember exactly this is this, but I know that these three, ten plagues were divided into three and seven. This could probably be the three were not. Uh, God is making a distinction. The first three plagues were universal meaning both uh, they were affecting both the, the Egyptians and God's people but then the last seven God is going to draw a line of distinction is saying these plagues are exclusively for the Egyptians and that could be a reference I don't remember if there's some more specific here at this time but these are some of the waymarks connected with the Millerite history and uh, I believe for now we're going to finish our presentation here and it is my prayer that we will continue uh, gathering some lessons as we will in our next studies we're going to take a closer look into the history of Ezra and also uh, some components that are connected with the history of the Millerites. So let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the way you have led this mighty movement. Adventism was born from the Millerite movement. There are our, they are our forefathers. We understand that we are to repeat their history. And we are already living in that repetition. It's our intention to understand it. It is our intention to partake of the heavenly manna. That we may understand these things with in depth. That we may be transformed by beholding them by claiming the promises you have given us, that through this manna, through this bread of heaven, we will, uh, pure, be, we will be purified, and you will give us the character that we need to possess as we surrender fully in obedience to, to your word. I pray that this will be our experience. Continue to be in our midst. Continue to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.